Well, welcome everybody to this webinar on neurological associations of COVID-19. My name is Professor Tom Solomon. I'm a neurologist based at the Walter Neuro Center in Liverpool. I'm also the director of the Health Protection Research Unit here in Emerging Infections. And this webinar is being hosted by the Global Health Network and being sponsored by the Brain Infections Global Programme. I'll tell you a bit more about those in a second. So in addition to myself, we have uh, three other speakers and I'm gonna get them to introduce themselves now by the wonders of the World Wide Web. Let's see how this goes. Leonardo, first of all. Yes, uh, hello, good afternoon. My name is Leonardo Fantoni. I'm a full professor of neurology at the University of Milan in Milano, Italy, right in the epicenter of the, of the pandemic. And I'm here as a director of the neurology unit and the stroke unit. Good afternoon. And next, Laura Benjamin. Hi, I'm Laura Benjamin. I am a senior clinical fellow at the Queen Square Institute of Neurology and an honorary consultant neurologist at the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery. Thank you. And Abhinath. Yeah, I am the, um, at the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. And uh, I'm the clinical director as well as the uh, chief of the section of and neurological infections at the National Institutes of Neurological Disorders and Stroke. Thank you very much, great. And I've known Avi and Laura for a long, long time, so it's great to catch up with old friends. And I've, I've known Leonardo for at least uh, 24 hours, and it's great to make new friends. And I think during this COVID-19 crisis, we're learning all sorts of things and uh, making the most of it in all sorts of different ways. So um, uh, welcome if you are on the Zoom webinar. There are 500 attendees on that. There were 700 re registered. Uh, those who could not make it uh, onto the webinar because we could only allow 500 attendees are able to watch this via Facebook. So welcome to the Facebookers as well. Now we're keeping our talks short because we want to hear from you. We want you to be able to ask questions and make comments. And the way that you do that, if you're on Zoom, is you go down to the bottom to the little tab that says Q&A and you post a question there and we'll keep an eye on those. Alternatively, uh, you can tweet. My Twitter is at runningmadprof, all one word, and um, I'll be keeping an eye on my tweet. Uh, we're being supported by the guys at the Global Health Network, uh, particularly Helena, and um, so uh, they will guide us through. For example, at the moment, uh, I cannot see any questions or answers. So I'm guessing that will become clear. Maybe it happens after I've stopped sharing my screen. Anyway, they can send me a message about that. They've got my, oh, here we are. Okay, they've made it a bit easier for me. Okay, there we are, there's a Q&A. Great, so what I want you to do, 500 people on uh, Zoom, is just where it says send in a question, just tell us the city and country that you're watching from. And similarly, if you're not on Zoom, if you're on Facebook, just tweet me at running mad prof or one word and uh, tell us where you're watching from. And that will allow us to know that there are people out there because it's quite strange at the moment. It feels just like I'm talking to my three friends, but that's fine. Uh, they, they're good friends. Okay. So whilst you're posting in those uh, uh, comments, I'll tell you a bit more about myself. I'm a, a neurologist here at the Walton Neuro Center in Liverpool in the UK. Um, I'm also a member of the infection and global health community in Liverpool and a lot of my research is on brain infections. And uh, this is the brain infections group. So we have uh, a large multidisciplinary team and we study all aspects of, of brain infections. And I've shown you there some of the leading researchers from the group, including Laura, who now is actually based in London. Um, a few years ago, we set up Brain Infections Global, which is a global network of uh, doctors, scientists, other healthcare workers who are studying brain infections as a team. And um, we do quite a lot through, it's mostly research on improving the management of patients with brain infections. You can see the website there. It, this is run through the Global Health Network. We um, do quite a lot of training. And if you look at the training tabs, uh, you'll see uh, how, how we do that. This is just a bit about the Brain Infections Global uh, on, the, on the website. So we have lots of members and lots of visitors, including 500 who have visited us in the past couple of weeks. You'll see why they've all visited us in a minute. 
and um, those are the top countries where the visitors come from. And um, we set up the COVID Neuro Resource uh, just a couple of uh, weeks ago, more like a month ago now. And um, you'll see lots of pe people have been accessing that. I'll show you a bit more about that in a second. Uh, these are some of the teaching resources available. Uh, we have the Neuro ID e-learning, which is freely available, and also the Neurological Infectious Disease course, which runs every year in Liverpool. It's not running this year. We're just considering whether to do it remotely. Um, so these are the COVID neuro resources on the Brain Infections Global website. And uh, you can see the two tabs there. And if you click on the COVID neuro resource tab, we are keeping here an up-to-date list of publications relating to COVID and neurological disease. And this is updated daily. Um, you can see the last update was yesterday and it'll be updated by the end of today. So we have all the published articles in peer-reviewed journals as well as things in the grey literature, i.e. non-peer-reviewed. And there's other key websites on there as well. Um, the other tab on the uh, that you'll have seen there is the COVID Neuro Network. And this is a network of neurologists or other doctors anywhere in the world who are interested in um, thinking about the neurological problems caused by COVID or associated with it. And um, if you uh, put your email address in, we will send you for free our case record forms that you can see on the left there, which are also attached to our syndromic case definitions. And this is giving us the opportunity as a global community to all collect data in the same kind of way and to think about it in the same kind of way. Uh, what you do with those data are up to you. We're just providing this as a free resource, but we will have the opportunity to pool our uh, data together, those that want to, to, to result in larger publications. That's something we can come back to at the end. Um, also, we've, uh, this is under review with the Lancet Neurology at the moment. It was, a, it was a paper they asked for, so we're hoping they'll accept it. And this paper is on the um, non-peer review section of the website. So again, at the end of the seminar, if you want to read a bit more and see some of our thinking, then you can go to there. So uh, that's everything from me in terms of introduction. Uh, we are about to move on and hear from first speakers actually Leonardo. Before we do that though, I will just uh, go through the, the questions and answers are coming in. I can see some old friends here like Nachma, who's in Coventry, and Ava Easton at the Encephalitis Society. Um, seeing people from all over the place, which is fantastic. Uh, people from India here, Malawi, excellent. All right, so the, uh, the, the uh, questions and answers are clearly working, and on the Twitter as well, I'm seeing lots of responses there as well. So we're going to hear from each speaker, they're going to talk for about 10 minutes and then we have five minutes Q&A after each speaker. And then if there's some time at the end, we'll have some general Q&A. Um, so please do send your questions in and I'll hand over now to our first speaker, Leonardo. Thank you very much. Um, again, good afternoon. Uh, I'm, as I said, I'm a neurologist and chief of neurology and stroke unit uh, department here at the Luigi Sacco Hospital in Milan. And Milan, as you, as you know, is right the epicenter of the pandemic, of the COVID-19 epidemic, uh, pandemic and, uh, in, in Italy, unfortunately. And by the way, our hospital has a long-standing tradition in infectious disease. Actually, the Luigi Sacco Hospital in Milan, just to give you a little bit of background, is one of the two national referral centers for infectious diseases in, uh, in, um, in Italy. Uh, I am not a, an expert in infectious diseases. Actually, I'm a, mostly a, a, a stroke neurologist. And what I would like to, to share with you this afternoon is just to give you briefly, of course, an idea of three major uh, issues. Uh, the first one is, is that I'm going to briefly mention which are the neurological complication of COVID-19 infection reported so far in the literature. And of course, you understand that this is a very fresh, very new literature. So more to come for sure in the, in the, in the journals. Uh, the second point I would like to mention uh, in, during this brief presentation is something that uh, concerns specifically the reorganization of the of the, uh, of the national health system and particularly of the regional health system here in Italy uh, following the COVID-19 pandemic. 
And the third point is I would like to just to give you briefly an idea and actually to, to comment a little bit on how the, 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 the COVID-19 infection and pandemic is affecting globally the health system, what I called, as you see here in the slide, the COVIDization of the health system. Okay, now, um, uh, briefly, uh, these are the neurological complications that uh, I've been uh, able to, to find in the literature with the PubMed uh, search done a few, year, a few days ago, actually. And as you see here, these are very uh, generic uh, neurological uh, 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 problems. Uh, you see that we go from loss of consciousness to headache, Caesars, dysphagia, dizziness, muscle pain, and myopathy. There, 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 there are some reports about the, an increased level of uh, uh, creatinine and phosphokinase. Uh, there are a few cases reported of acute cerebrovascular disease, um, problem with vision. And then perhaps more specifically, uh, there are reports about the, the, the incidence and the occurrence of uh, acute uh, polyneuritis of the uh, Guillain-Barré uh, type. Uh, also, uh, you are probably all aware of the fact that most of these, or at least many of these patients, uh, report uh, smell and taste disorders, what has been called specifically as smell uh, and or taste disorders in, uh, in COVID-19 infection. Also, there is another point that my might be of, of interest in two neurologists, that is the fact that uh, many of these patients that have, as we know, uh, very severe pneumonia and very severe pulmonary impairment, they in some way lack uh, a symptom which is very important otherwise, which is dyspnea. So many of these patients arrive to the emergency room without dyspnea, even though their uh, oxygen levels are very, are very uh, low. Now, I would like to now to to, okay, let me go back another second to the screen. Okay, one of the points, the major point is that how much this is specific to the COVID-19 infection? How much of this that is reported in this slide is specific to this specific infection? And how is there just by coincidence or other reasons we do not understand? So that's, to me, it's the main, main and major point to be discussed and maybe to be investigated in the next future. Now, uh, I would like now to stop share my, okay, uh, to, to, to go back to the full screen view and, and going uh, briefly to the other two points of my presentation, just to raise some discussion, to raise some questions. The first one is that the, the, the the COVID-19 pandemic has uh, made a major change in our uh, health system. You, you should know, you need to know that our uh, national health system, which is a public health system in Italy, is very much regionalized. So uh, uh, regions uh, have, um, um, can make uh, choices and different choices from region to, to, to regions. Uh, the Lombardia region, the region in which Milano is, is, is the largest uh, region in Italy. Uh, the Lombardia region is, has uh, more than 10 million of inhabitants, just to, to give you an idea, so it's a very large region. And the way the, the uh, health system has been reorganized, specifically during the pandemic, and just to remind you, we were in the middle and in the top, of the pandemic uh, during the, 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 the month of uh, March. We are now uh, seeing a decreasing number of patients, as, as you know, so we are in the decreasing part of the curve, the pandemic curve by now in Italy. Uh, during the, 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 the month of March, there, there has been a big, big reorganization of our health system, particularly of our regional health systems. And particularly for uh, um, other emergency. Uh, we have uh, specific pathways for uh, uh, emergency and time-dependent uh, disease and treatment, for example, stroke as a neurologist is one of the, the pathways that we are mostly interested in. And the reorganization has been uh, 
uh, one uh, that saw the closure of many of the stroke units to be in some way uh, reallocated as uh, COVID-19 units or otherwise uh, people, meaning health uh, care um, uh, professionals, doctors and nurses, have been reallocated in uh, uh, specific uh, words for the COVID-19 patients. This has been, of course, a terrible and major reorganization of the system uh, in that uh, many of the stroke units, as I said, and many of the neurology uh, words actually have been closed. Um, and all the strokes have been directed during this period to uh, only a few specific centers across the region. Uh, just to give you an idea, we had, uh, we used to have uh, more than 50 uh, stroke units in the Lombardia region. We ended uh, during the COVID-19 crisis with 10 stroke units for the entire region. So all the, 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 the strokes and basically the neurological emergency were, uh, were uh, brought to this specific let's call let's let's say and so-called uh, uh, hub centers which is not the typical hub and spoke organization on the stroke uh, care but it's just the uh, hub centers that receives all the strokes and keeps actually all the strokes in the in the same hospital for until they are they discharged so that this has been a big big uh, and and also very in a reorganization with very, very big impact on, on the assistance of, of, of stroke patients and of neurological uh, patients in general. Um, of course, there, there have been a lot of problems in this, in this sense, and uh, I, I will be happy to try to answer questions about the, 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 the one of the biggest questions is, uh, is about the uh, incidence of stroke during this period, as you might know, both stroke and myocardial infarction uh, have seen a dramatic decrease in terms of incidence during the COVID-19 pandemic, which in some ways is not uh, clearly explicable in uh, biological and medical terms, perhaps. And it's still something that we need to, to know why, to understand why it is has happened and in some ways still happening. Even though now that the pandemic is going down, uh, the number of strokes and myocardial infarction is again going back to higher levels. Um, the third and last point I would like to make with the, with the audience today is that, of course, we are now entering what is called, at least in Italy, the phase two, something that is after the pandemic. And, uh, and uh, this is in terms of, of, of course, social organization, organization of the society, but also in terms of medical organization. So now the hospitals are starting to go back to what they used to be before. And so the COVID-19 wards are becoming to be closed one by one, of course, not all together, not all, all, all at the same time. And the patients in the hospital with COVID-19 infection, they are decreasing in terms of number. And the other pathologies are coming back suddenly, you know, which is very, very striking. But the new organization has now to combine problems deriving from the infection, particularly from the COVID-19 infection, for example, concerning the risk of infection in the hospital, which has been a big, big problem uh, at least in our region, how many patients have been infected in the hospital by other patients, by personnel, has been a big, big dramatic problem. And how we can cope with this new organization for the future, for example, trying to divide in uh, 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 words in terms of COVID uh, positive and COVID negative uh, words, which of course is very, is very, is very difficult. So. Uh, I would like now to, to, to end this presentation and I will be very happy to try to answer questions. I'm not sure that I can answer questions, but I will be open to, to take questions. 
Great. Leonardo, thank you for that. Thank you for keeping to time. Thanks for raising some really interesting issues. We've got lots of questions coming in, some of which I'm going to hold because I know what some of the discussions are going to be a little bit later on. Um, one thing, this has come from Mark Taller in Birmingham, um, is asking about the incidence of delirium and whether you're seeing uh, because we hear a lot of descriptions, the Chinese, the Wuhan study, the first by Mao et al. talked a lot about delirium. What were your impressions of, of that? Um, I have to tell you, I have to tell you the, the story as I as I have seen it. Um, it's not been it's not been uh, easy for us as neurologists to see uh, too many patients with COVID nineteen in the hospital. Uh, of course, because of the risk of infection, uh, because uh, they were really very much closed and localized in some areas, and the access to these areas was very much restricted. And basically, the care of these patients has been basically in the hands of uh, infectious disease doctors, uh, anesthesiologists, of course, and, and pulmonary disease uh, doctors. Uh, we have been uh, requested very few times to see patients in the in the in the COVID nineteen world. So I, I cannot tell you exactly uh, the, the 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 amount of delirium in this population. I okay. might guess that uh, uh, concerning something that is um, um, that has to uh, deal with uh, oxygenation of, of the blood. Something that has to, to, to do with uh, staying in a single room, staying in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, an environment in which everybody is wearing a mask. Uh, you don't see faces. And uh, even you know, speaking and talking is very, it's very difficult. Uh, I can imagine that the room has been there a lot. What we miss by now, at least we miss in Italy, and I don't know how to to suggest things to other people mm -hmm. is that we, we do not know the real amount of this. Okay, thank you. That's that's great. And and clearly you mentioned uh, the the issues around stroke there, and a lot of questions have come in uh, from people. Uh, someone here in Georgia, in the United States, how strong is the link between stroke and coronavirus? Um, what we'll do then at this point is we'll move over to Laura Benjamin, who is going to talk about coronavirus and stroke from her perspective. So, Laura, over to you. Um, so, I'm Laura Benjamin, um, and um, I've been working in London, and that's where, I guess, in the UK, the epicentre of the stroke pandemic, not stroke, <laughs> the coronavirus um, um, has been in the UK. Um, and I've been working in the stroke unit, so I've actually seen a lot of stroke patients firsthand as well. I just kept completing a shift yesterday. Um, so next slide, please. So what I was going to try and do in this short spell is talk about the natural history of COVID-19, because I think that's quite informative of when disease arrives and give us some insight into mechanism of disease as well. It's describe the different ways that stroke cases will present in COVID-19 and, and the complexity of manage, management that arises from it and then postulate on possible mechanisms based on current evidence, and, and there are some, um, and also other infections, um, and take home messages from that. I guess I am a disclaimer to start with, I am not a SARS-CoV-2 expert, but for the last 10 years, I have been studying infection and stroke, particularly HIV. So there's only so many ways an infection can lead to stroke, um, so I hope I can translate some of that understanding. Next slide, please. So the natural history, um, I think this graph is quite important. Um, they, um, it's a cohort of nine people from Germany. Um, and what they did was sample swabs from different parts of the body. So um, nasal swab, sputum, stool, serum, and urine. And they looked at viral shedding over the period of time and also looked at viral infectivity. Um, next, please. Um, so I think important to see is that um, you somewhat have a peak around day six of virus, especially in the blood, when you're described as viremic, and then that starts to dec and decrease over time. Um, the biggest drop is around day 10, and that probably goes on to about day 22. Um, if you look at the, I haven't got a cursor, I'm afraid, sorry, um, but if you look at the bottom of the graph and you see positive culture, that's trying to give an indication of infectivity. 
And you can see that those dots will represent that they are able to culture it, but that disappears around day eight. And that means that despite um, the virus being present in the blood, they are no longer infected. And that's what that insinuates. And above that, you see a graph going up, which is seroconversion. That's where you build in the antibodies um, to the virus. And that starts increasing from day six, seems to reach um, a plateau around day 10 to 14. And it's important, I've um, demarcated it in yellow and blue. Um, the virological phase is where the virus is a dominant um, um, feature. Uh, and then the immunological phase is where the immune cells, the antibodies are more dominant. Um, and it'll be interesting to see where the stroke patients are falling because you find that most of them are in that transition from the biological phase to the immunological phase. Next slide, please. Um, but also to remember, this is something that I, I expected at the start of the epidemic, um, that we know historically, probably since 2004, that acute respiratory infection increases your risk of a stroke. Um, and that risk is particularly early in day one to three, and that's where it's highest. Um, so that means patients will be presenting with stroke and actually have COVID infection. And I saw quite a lot of that um, during um, my shift in the early part. And I suspect these guys have your normal risk factors that would normally get a stroke, but COVID just unmasks that. Next slide, please. And um, so the basis of studies that are available at the moment are very limited, three, um, two case series and one case cross-sectional study. Um, so the information out there is very, very limited. Um, and a lot of it is first-hand experience, which I will impart some from mine as well. Um, the age range is wide, but I think the New England Journal paper that came out recently, they focus on young people. And I think the emphasis is to show that young people are also coming in with strokes who would not normally present with strokes and would not normally have vascular risk factors. The important thing to look at, which I extrapolated from each of the data, was the median time of when they had their respiratory symptom onset, if that was available information, to when they presented with their stroke. And you can see that that happens around day nine, um, day 15. But if you recall back to that graph I showed you in that transition from that biological to immunological phase. Next, please. So I'm gonna describe three cases. Um, and each of them have important messages. So the first one is a 64 year old man who came in initially with breathlessness and he came in around day 310 of his symptom onset. Um, he had nucleic acid testing of his nasal swab and that was positive for COVID-19. He became more distressed with breathing and required CPAP. Um, and by day 18, he started developing weakness of his left side, but that was rather mild. Um, he had a scan, which is panel A, which is a DWR, um, so it's um, susceptibility weighted imaging, um, just to show there were some micro hemorrhages, but he actually had a, a stroke in his left cerebellum. On day 19, he had, um, it was de detected that he had bilateral PEs, and he was started on treatment dose anticoagulation with some trepidation, obviously because of these micro hemorrhages and the area being in the eloquent area. Um, but that was matched with serial imaging to make sure that um, nothing was progressing. On day 22, he developed acute bilateral coordination and bilateral hormonal hemianopia. And you can see on that panel B that he had developed uh, a stroke in his PCA. Um, so that was quite unusual because he was already on treatment dose anticoagulation and still went on to have further clots. And when you look at his blood markers, you may understand why. His D dimer was sky high, 80,000. As in, you shouldn't expect to get more than 800 even in a, in a stroke patient, irrespective of the type of stroke you have. So that's significantly higher than what you'd expect. And beyond the level of an acute phase response, that suggests a thrombin formation and de degradation. Um, and the fibrinogen being high as well um, is supportive of that. He was also lupus anticoagulant positive. Um, anticholulitin positive to IgG, IgM uh, for medium theta, which is something of, of significance. And BT2 glycoprotein is more of a um, specific antiphospholipid antibody, but low theta. So you wonder in this gentleman whether he has some form of antiphospholipid syndrome with anterior and um, with the arterial and venous um, um, thrombosis. But obviously, you have to wait for 12 weeks to make that diagnosis. Um, but in, in the context of thrombosis, you have to anticoagulate. And in his case, his anticoagulation was 
optimize into high intensity dosing from 1.5 milligrams per kilogram to two milligrams per kilogram. And that seemed to settle things. He did reasonably well and was discharged home with minimal impairment. Next slide. Um, the second case um, was a 24 year old female who came under my watch um, and there was no symptoms of respiratory symptoms when you required retrospectively. She had, she was a late presentation of a large middle cerebral artery stroke. You can see um, on the top panel and um, the hyperdensity. She had mass effects and actually required decompressive surgery. Um, at the time of presentation, there were some abnormalities. She had a low hemoglobin, normal platelets, and she also had lupus anticoagulant positivity as well. Um, at this point, this was as, as the um, peak was ascending. And so COVID wasn't really on our radar at that stage, especially um, in, in the sense of thinking about, so we tested her and she was negative at that point. So we didn't really think beyond that. Um, she had some periods of respiratory distress. So um, she had a CT chest, um, which showed um, a PE. Um, but also looking at her chest at the bottom, you can see that she has some ganglass changes, which is very typical and bilateral typical of a past COVID infection. Um, and although she came early on, now that when we're coming through the down phase of the epidemic, we're seeing a lot more of these type of patients where they are nucleic acid negative, um, but actually have characteristic changes of COVID in their chest, which proves, um, which is obviously, it's a challenge. If you don't think about it, you miss this patient. Um, she had air and sensuality just to show that she didn't have any other etiologies that contributed to this um, large um, territory stroke. Next slide. And the last one is just an example of the questions that are now emerging um, for stroke physicians, especially. Um, so 69 years old, hypertension, distress in breathing, he presented at day 15 um, after having isolated his home, and he had SATs of 80%. His swab was positive for um, SARS-CoV-2. But day 20, he required intubation, um, and he had that to, up to day 28. He had lots of complications during the time of his... Um, and ITU stay, including AKI with inter intermittent infiltration, radioarrhythmias, and atrial fibrillation. On day 29, he was weaned off and they noticed an asymmetrical left sided weakness. And her scan showed that he had a stroke. Um, so, this is what's now emerging. And, we, and, I, and, and last week, I had four phone calls or, um, this week, in fact, four phone calls from ITU consultants asking what to do in this case. As in most patients will be anticoagulated anyway, and that's a general recommendation from the International Society of um, Hemostasis and thrombosis and um, hemostasis. Um, but uh, the, the question is, is it safe? Um, and generally, um, it, it is safe because um, prothrombotic state is also probably contributing to the stroke, um, and um, it's a risk-benefit decision-making process. So generally, we say continue. But the question is then when to stop. Um, and, I, and I guess the important things to think about in that state is whether you think this is a thrombus in situ from the actual COVID infection, whether you think it's a cardioembolic event, which is plausible with his tachyarrhythmias and atrial fibrillation. Um, and some of that may be induced by COVID with um, in intercurrent myocarditis, or some of it might just be induced by a critical illness. Um, and the, the important thing is to look for ongoing risks such as atrial fibrillation and investigate for that or anticoagulating antibody to decide when to stop. Next slide. So the emerging themes here are they are younger um, or younger than what we would normally expect patients presenting with strokes. Sometimes they have asymptomatic respiratory symptoms. They're characteristically large vessel strokes, what we're seeing. They're com um, it's a later complication of COVID-19. They're hypercoagulable. Um, and there's a high burden in ITU. And this leads to challenges such as recognizing COVID-19 and also how to manage them in terms of anticoagulation. Next slide. Um, so just a couple more slides to just give some indication about mechanism. Um, so that's um, the picture on the right is just shown an artery and the innermost layer is the endothelium. Um, and that's surrounded by intima layer and the larger vessel caliber and smooth muscle and the important thing is that um, and smooth muscle the presence of it indicates large vessel um, and uh, and this diagram on the 
um, other side there, and um, shows that actually um, the, um, the SARS-CoV inclusion cells are seen, or viruses are seen in the actual endothelial cells, and there is inflammation associated with that. So two things that emerge from this histopathology work of kidneys, lungs, and um, mesenteric tissue is that there's endothelial damage, but there's also evidence of infection of the endothelium as well. Next slide. Um, and then we know that the, um, for infection to happen, you need um, ACE2 protein, which is a membrane bound protein. And this histopathology work was done actually in 2004 when the first SARS epidemic happened. Um, and the important thing to show is that um, ACE2 is predominantly expressed in lung endothelial and also in all endothelial and smooth muscles and in the brain, endothelial and smooth muscle. Um, I'll skip the next slide just to finish off because I'm running out of time. All I want to say in this slide is that um, there's a possibility for vasculitis to bear in mind for what we're seeing. Next slide. Um, so the take home message is that stroke could be a presenting syndrome of COVID-19. Um, and that might have implications on infection control, so look out for that. Um, large vessel stroke appears to be the characteristic subtype, and um, they may be hypercoagulable. Don't miss PEs. A couple of lots of patients are presenting with both PEs and large vessel strokes. Um, and look for APL as well, because that has implication in long term anticoagulation. Vasculitis could be a possibility, um, but you need to look for it. Um, and late presentation, um, don't forget, they may be negative and nucleotidic, but it may still be contributing to a hypercoagulative state, so hunt for COVID. Um, and early therapeutic anticoagulation may be helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you very much. Sorry, I was muted. Um, that, was, that was great. A really helpful run through and loads of questions coming through. Um, so, um, we're not going to have time to go through them all by any means, but some of the really practical clinical ones that I'd, I'd like to, to put to you, uh, Laura, and, and maybe also Leonardo and Abby, and let's have some quick answers. Firstly, should we be looking for COVID in any young, a young stroke patient now? Should it be considered like HIV, something that's man, a mandatory test? Absolutely. Um, but what screening um, um, tools that you use is tricky. Um, ideally, they should have all have CT scans, but um, that's not practical. Uh, and D-dimer, although maybe high, may not be as high at that later phase. So as in, we're trying to set up a protocol and trying to use D-dimer, but rightly or wrongly, um, but you need to do something and we need to look for it. Okay, another, yeah. sorry, Leonardo, go ahead. Um, uh, Tom, I, I think that uh, uh, your question is, for the next few years actually, because by now we are testing for COVID-19 all the patients coming to the hospital. There is no way out for, a, for a, an area like ours. So we need to test all the patients in order to know whether or not they have COVID-19 independently but of the presence of stroke. For the future, your question may, may be uh, relevant, but again, we need to, to understand how the, the, this is a, really relation of just coincidence because the incidence of stroke is supposed to be anyhow uh, very very high the other way around is also important that everything is attributed to COVID-19 these days that's another problem we had two days ago a patient with a, a an herpes encephalitis which was not recognized for the first three days because everybody was thinking of COVID-19 and until we yeah. finally okay Yes, F examination and the virus, the herpes virus was there. The diagnosis Thank you. was not made. That's a really important point. Thank, thank you very much to consider all the other conditions as well. Okay, well, we'll move on now to Avi Nath, but I think we will have time for more general discussion at the end. So, um, Avi, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you again. And Avi's going to talk about some of the disease mechanisms that might be underlying some of the problems that we're seeing. Over to you, Avi. Uh, thank you, Tom. Okay, so uh, Tom asked me to talk about the disease mechanisms um, of uh, COVID-19 in these neurological patients. And so, um, um, I don't know if you can see two slides at the same time, or is it just one? I hope you're not seeing the entire thing, but might have to we're go. Seeing, we're seeing two slides, but if you go to, slides? I think you're on okay. presenter view, if you go to just normal view rather than presenter view, we'll just see um, one slide at a time. Yes. Okay, so I'm going to go over a few neurological conditions and see 
um, and discuss the possible pathophysiology that may be underlying these things. Of course, as you know, very little is really known about the pathophysiology, so a lot of it is speculative at this point in time. Uh, and ospnea seems to be a very common symptom in these patients, and the question really has been whether this represents um, a portal of entry for the virus into the brain. And so a number of people have tried to address it in different ways, and here uh, this recent paper shows that um, when you look for the receptor of SARS-CoV-2, which is the uh, ACE2, you find it in these non-neuronal cells, uh, which are these sustentacular cells. And here are two individuals. One is an 89-year-old male and a 39-year-old uh, uh, female. And again, it is only those cells that seem to be expressing the receptor. Uh, and here in that same paper, they show that you can also find it in vascular cells, pericytes, and uh, some of the other vascular cells as well, indicating that um, most of the damage uh, to the neurons there is due to infection of other cell types and maybe not directly um, at, through infection of the neurons. Then uh, what about encephalitis? Uh, so there are very few cases of encephalitis that have been reported uh, with SARS-CoV-2. And um, Although, um, as Leonardo had mentioned earlier, delirium and some of the other symptoms may be common, it's often been hard to separate encephalitis from um, metabolic encephalopathy. Uh, but uh, here is one uh, in which you can, this is a 24-year-old male with fever, loss of consciousness, generalized seizures, neck stiffness, and the CSF uh, was positive for the virus. And you can see a small lesion here on the temporal lobe as well as in the adjoining um, ventricle, ventricular wall over here. Um, and then we do have some uh, uh, evidence from some of the other coronaviruses that encephalitis can occur. And this is from uh, OC43. And this is a paper in New England Journal of Medicine. And here they showed that there was infiltration of macrophages and T lymphocytes and immunostaining for the nucleocapsid protein of the virus. Now this patient did have combined immune deficiency, so that made that child vulnerable. Uh, from the SARS virus, um, it, interestingly, there's this one um, really nice neuropathology article where they had eight cases, and all eight of them were positive for uh, SARS in the brain, and they looked at it in many different ways. Here I'm showing you in situ hybridization with signal in the cytoplasm, but they also did PCR and electron microscopy uh, confirming their findings. So the question is, how does the virus get into the brain? Certainly it can get there through the blood vessels and very, uh, vascular spread can occur. Uh, but in addition to that, um, there's this animal model uh, with coronavirus that has been studied quite extensively. And what they show is that if you instill virus into the nasal cavity, you can, over a period of time, gradually see that it transitions uh, all the way down to the brainstem. And I think uh, that is important because, as mentioned earlier, the possibility that there may be some central hypoxia has been brought up. And uh, is it possible that there may be infection in the pons and medulla uh, that could account for some of that is a question that remains unanswered right now. So, uh, as I said, people are looking for the receptor um, uh, in the brain. Now, there are two receptors that have uh, um, uh, made the list so far, and besides ACE2 is this um, uh, protease uh, called uh, TMPRSS2. And I looked up the Allen's brain atlas, and interestingly, you actually don't find much in the brain at all. So the question really is, if there isn't much in the brain, then how does the virus really infect any cells in the brain? Um, and I think a possible mechanism might be that the receptor itself uh, can be induced by gamma interferon. So it has um, a, um, a mechanism by whereby cytokines could induce it. So it is quite possible that uh, induction of the receptor may occur in neurons in the setting of um, um, massive inflammation, and that might also explain why the encephalitis is relatively rare in this patient population. Uh, then, interestingly, there are a number of um, uh, post-viral syndromes that have been described with the virus, and um, as previously mentioned, Guillain-Barre syndrome can occur, and 
um, uh, it's not just the demyelinating form of Guillain-Barre, but in addition to that, the axonal form has been described. The Miller-Fisher variant has been described. And I have interacted with one patient who also had a sensory uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome. So, uh, and these patients were reported, they have the classical uh, increase in protein in the CSF with very few cells. Uh, there are few patients with uh, transverse myelitis. Um, and we think that that is likely immune mediated. Guillain-Barre syndrome, as you know, is most likely antibody mediated. And uh, additionally, there are a few cases of acute disseminated encephalomyelitis and a single case of acute hemorrhagic encephalo encephalomyelopathy, which we think is cytokine mediated. Here, you usually don't find virus in the brain. And it is uh, an interesting phenomenon, but there's only one patient reported so far. So the question is, how do you get all these autoimmune syndromes? Um, if you look at the structure of the virus, what is unique about it is that it has this lipid envelope here. And this is made out of phospholipids. And in this um, lipid uh, envelope, there is the protein called the E protein. And so here you can see this E protein actually forms a primitive channel here. And here's the, uh, all the phospholipids. So it's quite possible that together they may become antigenic. And uh, so autoantibodies may develop against these phospholipids. And uh, that may account for the possibility of some of the antiphospholipid syndrome and possibly even the Guillain-Barre syndrome. Um, here are our, uh, patients with acute disseminated encephalomyelitis. Now this is with uh, the MERS uh, virus. And you can see there is this massive um, white matter changes here on the MRI scan in this patient. And in the discussion, they wondered whether this was all acute disseminated encephalom uh, encephalomyelitis or could there have been a vasculopathy in addition to it. Now this patient clearly looks more like a um, ADEM uh, type of uh, uh, picture here. Um, and this is the single case from Detroit um, of acute hemorrhagic encephalo, um, uh, hemorrhagic encephalitis. And uh, you can see what is typical of these patients is that they get these bilateral lesions in the thalamus. And uh, then it can go on to uh, uh, develop multifocal lesions in the brain, but often they are bilaterally symmetrical. And here you can see some blood on the uh, MRI scan here. That's the hemorrhagic component. And so it is thought that uh, these patients um, usually have a, um, a cytokine syndrome that mediates these um, um, changes in the brain. And uh, here in this patient was uh, positive for COVID-2, but um, it was not done in the spinal fluid. Okay, so I'll stop here and uh, take any questions that there might be. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Abby. Thank you very much. That, that's great. Okay, there are some questions uh, specifically for you. And then also there are, there are so many other questions, just to give you a heads up. I think what we're going to do at the end is just a very quick fire, rapid round of questions and answers um, with all the panelists. One question for you, Abby, is just a bit more about this idea of central hypoxia relating to brain infection or brain inflammation. Do you think we are likely to see that. We know it happens in things like polio, where you have a lot of inflammation going on in the brainstem that you can see on an MR scan. And do you think you're likely to have a similar hypoxia syndrome when we're not seeing so much inflammation on the brain scan in, for the brainstem? So, so far, nobody has described a brainstem encephalitis in these patients. So, you know, they're not developing all the other things. So one would have to hypothesize that just the respiratory centers alone are being involved. Um, is that possible? I guess theoretically it's possible. One could envision that you have this massive infection in the lung, maybe there's retrograde transmission along the uh, nerves that innervate the lung and they go directly to the medulla and then from there to the palm. So, um, but you know, and nobody knows for sure. The second route could be uh, through the um, a nasal cavity and along the olfactory tracts, and you have to envision how it could then track all the way down to the brainstem. Certainly in mice it can happen, but in humans that's going to be hard. So I think the jury is still out. 
Okay, thank you very much. Um, let's see what else we've got here. Uh, let's and also let's open up all the other videos if we could. Okay, a question for you, Abby, about virus detection in the brain and how much of that is being seen, or at least in the spinal fluid, how how, how much of that's being so seen, only, how important you think it is to see that? Over. Yes, there are only a couple of cases in which these have been reported in the spinal fluid. Uh, there were um, some autopsy cases probably from Seattle. There were two, and there were several autopsy cases there, I think eight or 10, of which they examined the brain only in two. And, um, and they didn't find any virus in the brain. Um, although they don't give you all details of where in the brain did they look for it, how hard did they look, and so on and so forth. So they say, at least by PCR, they didn't find it. Now, there's one case reported from Mount Sinai in New York. This patient did have frank encephalitis. And they published only one figure, uh, which was an electron microscopy from the brain showing virus coming out of endothelial cells. And they said there was some out of neurons, although it was quite fuzzy and very hard to see. But they don't provide you any other evidence of detection of virus. So I think currently we really need autopsy tissue to be able to answer these things. Laying our hands on autopsy tissue has been very hard. Uh, we've received two uh, very recently in our own lab and so we're actively looking uh, for that possibility. Uh, Tom, you're muted. I know. There we go. Thanks. Okay, great. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a go at answering some of these many, many questions that have come in. Uh, we're due to finish at two o'clock. So those who want to leave at two, please do. But I think the panelists are all going to stay just give me a thumbs up if you are that's good um so we'll probably go for maybe five or ten minutes and just get through them all uh, as many as we can the panelists are going to raise a hand if they'd like to answer the question they're going to answer in one sentence if they can so first question here from david nickel in birmingham and it's about neuro rehab of patients who are minimally aware um, and who had COVID-19 and now have a tracheostomy. What advice for the nursing homes? Should they use full PPE for suction forever? Wow, that's a tough question. Who wants to answer that? Maybe Leonardo, I mean, give us a sentence. How are you? And you can unmute yourselves. Yeah, go ahead. How, what's your advice for these people uh, for long-term care of tracheostomies, et cetera? One sentence. The answer is that we don't know. <laughs> Fair enough. We'll take that. David Thanks. Nichol. <laughs> Really, that, that, that's actually that's a tough question. It's very difficult because everything has to be built since the beginning by now. Everything is very new. So we, don't, we do not know. I, I guess that's a good answer. There's so much we don't know. But when we don't know, we have to uh, adopt a precautionary principle and be as safe as we can. Now, Deborah Snyder has, has sent us one. This is actually really an individual case that she wants help with managing. And I don't think that would work in this forum. We'd have to give them more than one sentence. But what I will say is maybe we'll get someone to come back to you with that. Frank in Maryland, what about neurological syndromes in HIV patients uh, with COVID? Laura, your, uh, your interest in HIV, have you come across that? What, what would you expect to see, if anything, over? Um, so interestingly, we've, we just um, mentioned who's admitted with HIV stroke with an inflammatory vasculopathy. Um, and a, a quite inflammatory CSF. Um, we're hunting for SARS-CoV-2 at the moment. Um, I suspect that they may have a different manifestation because they are on triple antiretrovirals. So some of that might mute the response as you'd normally expect with, uh, with um, SARS-CoV-2. But I don't think that will stop the endothelial damage. Or, or inflammation that may come along with it. So they could still get the hypercoagulable comp complications. So my hunch from, um, from research in it is that they may not present as they would normally, but they may come with strokes. Um, and okay, that's good. Thanks, okay. Uh, we're gonna try and keep our answers to, two sentences will allow people. <laughs> Avi, Avi, I think this is a good one for, for you, if you if you don't mind. It's come from Jane. Hassel, a pediatric neurologist in London, um, asking about uh, neuro disease without the features of COVID-19. So clearly sometimes they present with neuro before the respiratory. Um, what about seeing pure neuro, no respiratory, and even without systemic features like the lymphopenia, the transaminitis, the raised d dimer Because that raises a question of who, who we should be testing going forward. Avi. 
So that is very problematic. There are a few cases and uh, two at least that I've heard of myself and talked to where the presenting symptoms were neurological and the respiratory symptoms were very mild or none at all. Uh, that poses a huge public health problem because you can't possibly screen everybody in any every neurology clinic, especially in areas where there's low incidence of the virus. And uh, yeah. uh, But I think those cases really need to be collected and maybe the way, Tom, that you're collecting them is the right way to do it. And uh, that way we can get a better feel for how big this problem really is. Thanks. Thank, thank you, Avi. Okay, um, next question is about loss of taste. When can we expect the loss of taste to come back? Who'd like to have a go? What have you seen? So how, long does, from your... how long does it last? Yeah, how long till the loss of taste comes back? In our experience, about one month, roughly. About one month. Thank you. Okay, here's a question from the Charité in Berlin, uh, Patrick Bay. Um, yeah, it's a bit about the reorganization of services. Um, did you, well, are you testing now all stroke patients? I think that's the question. Are you testing all stroke patients for COVID-19? We've sort of covered that already. What, what, what's your feeling going forwards? As in, it's, it's similar to what Alvin, um, Alvin said, it's a, it's a public health issue. Um, we need serology um, and that would be a nice way to assess it, but we haven't got that. And um, so we're using other tools that may not be validated. Um, and I think it's a, it's a difficult thing and there's no right or wrong answer. Okay, thanks, um, Laura. Bill Theodore in Bethesda, Maryland. Um, limited data from China suggests there's not been an increase in seizures. What's the experience of the panel in terms of seeing seizures? More than you'd expect, less than you'd expect? Avi, do you want to have a go at that? Okay, so at least one paper that I came across claimed that those patients who have underlying seizure disorders, uh, they can lose control of their seizures. And that makes sense. If you have fever or a cytokine abnormalities and immune failure, that can happen. But the incidence of true seizures just by themselves is very rare, unless there's florid encephalitis. Two cases of encephalitis were presented that had seizures as a presenting symptom. Same experience here, yes. Yeah, thank you. Fatima in uh, Nigeria, Fatima Zangina in Nigeria. Um, we've seen quite some cases presenting with insomnia and others with restlessness. How common is that in other countries? Leonardo. Uh, uh, this is not scientific, actually, but I, I heard a lot of people, people I know personally, with a lot of uh, sleep disorders the day, also the day before, what then became a, a, an obvious uh, infectious disease. So no scientific uh, answers to that, but I, I suspect there is something. Okay, thanks. And then... Um... Charles Rhodes in Charles Rhodes in Rhodes, USA. That's interesting. Uh, Charles Rhodes, uh, or maybe he's Charles in Rhodes, USA. Uh, the question is: Are mental status changes a recognised initial presentation uh, of COVID nineteen infection? So, who's any, anyone seen patients presenting with confusion or other mental status changes as their very first presentation? No, I think my are, I've seen that in the literature, in our, in our review of the literature, which we, we posted online, there were a couple, but they pretty rapidly developed uh, respiratory disease as well. Abby? Yes, so there's one uh, neurologist I talked to in New York who himself came down with the COVID-19 and uh, he claimed he became quite delirious uh, and then the respiratory symptoms followed um, and he was quite hypoxic. He even claimed that he had central hypoxia. But when you're a neurologist, sometimes you may overdiagnose yourself too. So. <laughs> Definitely. Here's a, okay, thank you for that. Um, this is a good one for you, Laura, I think, coming from Simon Bell in Sheffield. I'm modifying the question slightly. But should we be thinking about anticoagulating patients who have COVID-19 and no other features? Or, you know, how, at what stage should we say, here's somebody at risk of, of, of thromboembolic disease. I want to do something. Laura. Um, so the, this is an easier question because the International Society of Thrombosis and Hemostasis have actually given guide, guidance on this. Um, they suggest that if your D-dimer is three to four times increased the upper limit of normal, patients should probably be admitted and have anti um, prophylactic anticoagulation and um, low molecular weight. Um, and there is one study, which is retrospective, but actually 
looked at anticoagulation in, in patients and classified by D-dimer. And there was no difference um, at lower D-dimers, but at greater than six, there was a difference um, and, and associated with a better outcome. So in that sense, a lot of patients in ITU where they have high D-dimer do consider giving almost doing UK, I think, intermediate or treatment dose anticoagulation. So you can extend that in the sense to stroke as well, risk stratifying hemorrhagic transformation and, and all those aspects, and, and you have some guidance to anticoagulate patients. Okay. There is an ongoing study in our region, case control study about that. The, the question, as Laura will see, is about who to treat with that kind of anticoagulation. You should, uh, you know, divide the patient according to the dimer uh, levels. That is unclear, but it, there is an ongoing trial now. Good. Great. Thank you for that. Next one is um, uh, coming from Nesha Martinez Arengo. She's asking whether the neurological symptoms relate to the severity of lung damage. Um, she's curious about the lung brain axis. I think I'll broaden that slightly uh, because we know that those with bad disease, lung disease or else, elsewhere are more likely to present with the delirium. But I, I want to know what you feel about whether we are seeing more than we would with any other septic type condition that makes you a bit hypoxic and a bit unwell. Do you think we're seeing more of this non-specific encephalopathy delirium than we would in other patients with, with other infections? Who'd like to answer that? Uh, I, I don't know, actually. The, the, the problem is that we are, the, the pandemic uh, issue is it's a cr crucial one because we are seeing so many patients at the same time that it's very hard to to make epidemiological consideration uh, correct epidemiological consideration by this time. Right. There's a question about from Aaron in Birmingham. Does there appear to be a role for steroids in COVID stroke patients? Um, I don't think we have enough evidence. <laughs> no evidence. Study needed. Anyone, by the way, who was interested in studying some of these things, sign up to the network because um, these are the kind of questions that can be answered through a, a network. Uh, let's see. Neil Robertson, is there evidence that patients with chronic neurodisease on immunosuppressive drugs, we've not touched on this at all, of course, we do have a large number of patients on immunosuppressive drugs, do they have more severe disease course with COVID-19 or indeed a milder disease course because they're, uh, you know, they, they, they've been immunosuppressed? That's an interesting question. Neil Robertson, who'd like to answer that? Abby, would you like to have a go at that? So I, I believe that there are papers being uh, in uh, being uh, reviewed right now and um, very soon we should have that experience especially from the multiple sclerosis uh, group there and so what i have heard is that uh, some patients with rituximab have had pretty severe disease um, mm. uh, but uh, you know we really need to wait till we see these papers that come out um, and one can envision that if you have uh, if you're on those drugs where your cytotoxic immune response is really impaired that uh, you could have pretty severe disease. No. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see what else we've got here. Patients with pure neuropresentations, are they contagious? I guess you're going to have to treat them as, you know they've got virus on board. Um, I'm not sure we'd use the word contagious anymore unless we're planning a movie. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think if you, if you picked up uh, COVID-19 in a patient who had a pure neurological presentation, but you've detected the virus on them, you're going to have to treat them as, in, as, as an infection risk, aren't you? Would anyone disagree with that? Yeah, I think that's fair. Yeah. Okay. Um, the myopathy, Simge Yonter asks a bit more about the myopathy. Uh, uh, what are the EMG findings in those patients? I think... Leonardo, you mentioned you'd seen a couple of those. Yeah, we, we have seen a couple of patients in the intensive care unit, and they have, uh, as I said, increased level of um, creatinine phosphoglease and a um, uh, typical uh, myopathic pattern of uh, EMG. Um, again, the problem here is to see whether this is specific for this infection or whether this is connected with a, a critical illness myopathy. So that's the point. So I think that only from the epidemiological point of view, we can answer this. So we will see in the future, if we have data and time enough to do that, whether the incidence of this myopathy is higher in this specific COVID-19 population. 
Okay, thank you. This is a quick uh, question from my colleague, Nick Silver, who's a headache specialist here in the Walton Centre. He's probably in the next room. Nick, you could have knocked on the door. Anyway, the question is, should we be suspecting COVID in patients presenting purely with a new daily persistent headache of recent onset? Wow. If that's the case, Nick, are, are you going to be testing me, I think? And half my colleagues. What do you think? <laughs> Laura? <laughs> I'm not sure. I don't know. I think you have to have more than just headache is what I would say, uh, Tom. Uh, otherwise, you'll have a very large population and people get new onset headaches for a variety of different reasons, you know. Now, here in Milan, we suspect COVID-19 infections for any kind of disturbance you might have. So it's, it's so generalized. So it's, that, that's the problem, actually. I, everything is attributed to that. So. I, I suspect, I mean, I think my approach would be if it's a very, if there's something odd about the headache, if it's a very severe headache and there's a bit of meninges and then you might be, I personally I'd be inclined to push Many, it. many of the mild patients with, uh, with COVID-19 infection, I mean, those who do not enter the ICU unit, of course, they, they, they refer, they have mild headaches, not very severe actually, mm. mild headaches is quite common. Thanks. Someone called Scott Paul is asking about uh, children. Um, neurological findings in children, uh, I think a lot less than in adults. I've seen in the grey literature a publication about encephalitis, but I've not seen a lot. I don't know if anyone else has. Yeah. Question here about from Waleng Nankup. Uh, how good is the performance of CSF PCR? Should we trust a negative result? So PCR does have some problems. Um, you know, even the nasopharyngeal swabs, there are some false negatives there, and I, nobody understands exactly what it is and why these primers don't work as well. So I think if you strongly suspect that your patient has the infection, repeat the PCR again over a period of time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, cerebellitis, has anyone seen cerebellitis? No. No. No, no one's seen cerebellitis. Um, Dr. Mohapatra Moha is asking about the ACE2 and the TRP-MSS2 receptors. Are they expressed on trigeminal nerves, which might make a, a, an entry point for the virus? I don't know the answer to that. No, I don't. I would also add that although you hear about these two receptors, it's not that you need to have both receptors. They're two different ways for the virus to get in. One is uh, receptor-mediated endocytosis, and the other is receptor-mediated transfusion of virus through the external membrane, I think, isn't it, Abby? So yes, I've seen yes, some slightly right. misleading things in, in some of the literature about that. Yes. Um, okay. Uh, Anna Richardson from Manchester and uh, Dave says David McKee from Manchester. I think he's on Anna's, he's obviously logged in as Anna. Um, general question, should we be asking our labs to freeze samples of serum and CSF for COVID patients with neurological problems? Uh, Yes, you should. Um, we, he says we haven't got ethics committee approval for research yet, but it may be clinically justifiable. So I think for a start, I think you can test these. If you've got CSF, you can test it for virus. I don't think you need ethic approval for that. There is in the UK a national study called the Clinical Characterization Protocol run by my colleagues here in Liverpool, which has recruited 16,000 patients so far. And every hospital in the country is in that study. So if you have a patient with severe disease and you want to include them, then you put them in the study and then you can keep serum and CSF as, uh, ethically approved. The other thing is uh, another colleague in here in Liverpool, Ben Michael, with colleagues elsewhere in Southampton, uh, there's a big network of neurologists, stroke doctors, psychiatrists who have set up a registry and that is called Coronerve. So you can, if you're in the UK, you can search for that if you want to capture your patients through a registry. Um, all right, we're nearly timed out. Uh, let's just pick the last couple. Um, what about these patients who, when they're recovering or when they've recovered, are, are we seeing cognitive impairment in them, memory problems, etc.? We'd like to have a go at that. Again, too early to say that. Uh, it, it, I mean, we, we suspect they might have some cognitive impairment. We are trying to include this uh, as an outcome in, our, in our, one of our trials, actually. So, but we will see in the future. Too early now. Okay. Are you following patients up? Are people following the patients up? 
if you're yeah. watching this. Yeah, here's an interesting one from Mark Weatherall uh, down south. Why aren't we seeing more cerebral venous thrombosis in, in these COVID patients if there's a thrombotic state? That's a very good question mm. because with the, this very high level, Laura, what do you think? We, we should expect more. Yeah, no, but we're not seeing as much. Um, and, I, and I think the prevalence suggests that venous um, thrombosis is actually higher than arterial um, peripherally. So, yeah, I'm not seeing as much as we are arterial. Yeah. Okay. And just, uh, we'll, we'll, go, we'll go to our last question now. And just to, to those who are still on the call, maybe it's just the four of us chatting to each other. Um, to those who are still following, on the chat function, I've just putting out the link for people to go to the website if they want to download some of the things that we've talked about. Uh, let's have our last question now. Um, let's see what we've got. Okay. Let's finish with something easy. Would you each like to give uh, two, two questions, actually? Firstly, an easy question, which is, what are the most important three symptoms or signs to help you identify those patients? Let's have that first from Leonardo. You, you mean neurological symptoms? or Yes, or, yes. Uh, neurological symptoms, I would say by now, probably uh, loss of smell, and, uh, and taste, if you consider this a neurological uh, thing, of course. And then, then probably um, um, uh, headache, probably. And I'm not sure about sleep disorders, but I would suspect that that would be one. Thank you. Um, Laura? Um, I, I would say loss of smell and loss of taste. And also, I think there's high prevalence of Guillaume Barry, given we talked about mm -hmm. as much. So in, in those who present with you know, polyridiculopathy, acute, um, I would think about COVID in them um, and look for it. Thank you. And Abby? Yeah, I, I agree. Um, An ostomy on my LGL fatigue and the yeah. setting of fever should probably raise the um, yeah. raise suspicion for COVID-19. Thank you very much. Okay, well, that's, um, uh, we've finished on an easy question. The hard question I was going to ask you all about was to predict the future of neurological disease and COVID-19. But I, I think we'll hold that. We'll save that maybe for another day. I, I would say to those who have been listening in, if you want to just give us a bit of feedback now about whether you've found this interesting and worthwhile, you could do that via the questions, which we'll keep open. I think we'll also be sending you all uh, feedback forms. And if you complete those, we'll send you a CPD certificate because we know people like CPD certificates. And if there's enough uh, interest, then we may even do something similar to this, maybe in a couple of weeks again, to look at, a look at how things are shaping up. So um, I would like to finish by uh, reminding you to go to the Global Health Network website if you want to download any of the resources we've talked about, if you want to look at the daily update of neurological papers. Um, I'd really like to thank the panelists uh, very much. These guys are all busy clinicians. Uh, they're also busy doing research. They've taken the time out to join us. And um, so thank you very much for that. And also I'd like to thank Helena and her staff at the Global Health Network for putting all this together at short notice. So at that stage, I think we will let the um, audience disappear. We may ask the panelists just to hang on for a quick debrief. Thank you very much.